Hi guys, this is Kate, and this is the third video for week one of Math 23. We recently left off talking about vectors and points, and now we want to talk about what types of functions interact with vectors. So let's begin discussing matrices. You have probably seen matrices before. A matrix is an array of numbers. And in particular, matrices are described uh, in terms of how many rows and how many columns they have. So we say an M by N matrix over a field F, which just basically means all of the entries in the matrix belong to a particular field, whether that's the real numbers or the rational numbers or the complex numbers. We say an M by N matrix over a field F has M rows and N columns. Well, what does that look like? Let's draw one right here. Here is my M by N matrix. I've filled in some totally random numbers and note that I haven't even specified exactly how many rows are appearing here or how many columns, but you get the idea. We have M rows and N columns and the major thing to take notice of is that we are so used to listing horizontal length first and vertical length second and the opposite is true of matrices. So when we say M by N, M is how many locations are along this side, and N is how many positions are along this side. All right, well, what is so important about matrices? What kinds of functions do they represent? They represent linear functions, and we frequently refer to those specific linear functions as linear transformations. So what is a linear transformation? This is a really important definition. I can't stress that enough. A function, G, and this notation is may be new to you. This says that G is a function that maps from Fn, so this is its domain, and it maps to Fm, which you may have called range, but we will call codomain. There's a difference. We'll return to this later. So G maps from Fn to Fm, and it is called linear if the following is true. If the effect of G acting on a times the vector v plus b times the vector w results in the same thing as if you took a and multiplied that times g acting on the vector v by itself and then added on b times g acting on the vector w by itself. Now there are two different properties going on here. One is that the function value of the sum of two inputs is the same as the sum of the function value of the inputs separately. Let me write that specifically. This is what we're saying. We're saying that if G acted on the sum of V and W, that would be the same thing as adding together G acting on V and W separately. The other thing that's going on here in the definition of linearity is that if you take G and acted on a scalar multiple of V, that would be the same thing as taking G and acting it on V by itself and multiplying it by that scalar. Let's write that down. All right, so here this is specifically stating that the function G acting on A times the vector V would be the same thing as if we took G and had it act on the vector V and then multiplied that by A. And so when we take both of these properties that the function value of the sum is the same as the sum of the function values and that we can pull out this scalar multiple. When we combine these two properties, this is what we get. That we can separate the sum, then pull out the scalar coefficients. So that's how we get G acting on AV plus BW is the same thing as A times G acting on V by itself plus B times G acting on W by itself. I'm going to highlight this. It's so important for you guys to understand both of these properties and the definition as it's stated here. All right, well, what is so great about linear transformations? Remember at the very end of the last video when we were talking about the standard basis vectors, one of the great things about the standard basis vectors is that we can express any vector in the space as a sum of multiples of the standard basis vectors, right? We can take any vector v here 
and we could express it as the sum of scalar multiples of the standard basis vectors. For instance, the vector 3, 4 is 3 times e1 plus 4 times e2. Why is that useful? Well, if we know what g, our function, does when it interacts with all the standard basis vectors individually, and we know exactly how to express some vector as a sum of multiples of the standard basis vectors, then we can exploit linearity and we can rewrite g acting on v as g acting on this sum of multiples of the standard basis vectors, and then this is the linearity part, split that apart into various scalar multiples of g acting on the standard basis vectors individually, and if we know how g interacts with the standard basis vectors, then we can add them appropriately and multiply them appropriately to figure out how g acts on some vector v. All right, so how do we figure this all out? We know that g, some linear function, can be represented by a matrix because matrices represent linear functions. I want to be really clear that matrices themselves are not linear functions. They represent linear functions or linear transformations. So let's talk about how we can write down a matrix that represents a given linear transformation and also how we can compute what that linear transformation does to a given vector. So first, if we know what a linear transformation does to various standard basis vectors, in fact, all of them, it's really easy to write down what that matrix that represents the linear function looks like. And in fact, we can see right here, the matrix G that represents the linear function, little g, is formed by using G acting on E sub k as the kth column. So if we know what vector results for each standard basis vector, those are going to be our, the columns of our matrix. So it will look something like this. If I know what happens when g, the function, acts on e sub 1, that's what's going to go in the first column. Then whatever happens to e sub 2 when g, the function, acts on it goes here, e sub 3, Whatever happens when g acts on it is the third column, e sub 4, and g's interaction provides the fourth column, so on and so forth, all the way down to g acting on e sub k. So that's how we can write down the matrix g if we know all that information, what happens when g acts on the standard basis vectors. Well, the second question is, how do we calculate, given some matrix, capital G, the big G here, and some vector, little v, how do we calculate what g of v will be? Okay, well, I'm going to just make up a matrix g. Here it is. It is the matrix representation of little g. I honestly just made it pretty small, fairly simple. You can write down whatever matrix you want. You can go along with me or you can make up your own. Check back on your understanding here. What are its dimensions? It is a two by three matrix. So two rows, three columns. That means that it maps from R3. Note that every entry in here is from the field of real numbers. And we know that G maps from Fn. N is the number of columns. So we have three here. So it maps from R3 to fm, m here is the number of rows, so it goes from r3 to r2. That means it acts on vectors with three components and it spits out vectors with two components. That's how we write that. Well, let's pick a random three-dimensional vector, which will be our v, for it to act on. And I'd like you guys to write it a little bit above the matrix G, like this. So that's my vector V. I'll indicate that. And we want to know what happens when G acts on V. Well, G, the linear function, little g, is represented by the matrix, big G. And to find out what G acting on V is equal to, we take the matrix, big G, we multiply it 
by V on the right. Now some of you have probably done matrix multiplication before, but let's go over how to do this. The way we and the way we've aligned the matrix and the vector will help a great deal. Let's figure out what goes in this particular position because we already know that we're going to get a vector in R2 as a result. So I'll already draw that in. I'll reiterate this later, but every time you do any sort of matrix multiplication, the result will have the same number of rows as the first term in the multiplication and the same number of columns as the second term in the multiplication. So in this case, we have an element of R2. Now we're going to have one number here and one number here. And the way to calculate the first number up top here is we take, we're looking at the top row of G and the vector V. We're going to match up the first component here with the first component over here. Multiply them together. We have 0 times 0. That gives us 0. We now add on the product of this component and this component. 1 times 2. So, so far we have 2. Then we add on the product of this component and this component. Another 2 times 1, which is 2. So, we should result with 4 in the first component of our resultant vector W. We do the same thing for the second component down here, except now we care about the second row in the matrix G and the column up here, the vector V. So this component and this component, 0 times 1 is just 0. We now add on this component times this component, 1 times 3, which is 3, and this component and this component, which is 2 times 0, which is another 0. So we're left with 3 there. So the effect of the linear transformation, little g, on the vector v is the same thing as big G, which is representing our little g, acting on or multiplying by the vector v, and our result is 4, 3, which is in this particular example, our vector w. Now, we'll be going over this a lot, but some of you guys may be fans of imagery. I always think of this as a tree falling into a wood chipper or like a log. And so this component matches with this component, this component matches with this component, this matches with this component, you sum them together and it spits out into this particular component. Now, you guys should be familiar with how to write this using mathematical notation. First things first, um, here we have g sub i comma j. I want to call out one slight typo. This guy right here, g, he should be lowercase g. This is just what Hubbard, our textbook, uses. It should be little g. So it should look like little g sub i comma j. That denotes the entry in the ith row and the jth column of matrix g. So in our random example where we just picked a matrix g, if I wanted to know what little g 1 comma 1 was, that would be in the first row in the first column. If I wanted to know what little g 2 comma 1 was, that would be in the second row, which is down here, and then in the first column. That would be this guy. So little g sub i comma j is the entry in the ith row in the jth column of the matrix big G. And so when we express something like this, when we're trying to figure out what w is, this is the recipe to find w sub i. And you might be wondering, what the heck is w sub i? Well, it is the ith component of the vector w. So in this case, this guy here, the 4 is w sub 1, because it's the first component in the vector w. And this 3 here is w sub 2, which is the second component in the vector w. Let's label those. So what this recipe is saying is that to calculate the first component, or the ith component of the vector w, that's going to be the sum of g1, right, because these i's are staying constant. It's the j's that will be changing. You may be refreshing your knowledge of sigma notation here. g1, comma, we'll start with 1 times v1. Then g1, comma, 2 times v2 plus g1, comma, 3 times v3. Well, what is that doing? Well, g1, comma, 1 is this guy, right? It's saying we are staying in the same row of g. So the first row and then the first column times the first component of v plus 
the first row and the second column times the second component of v, plus the first row and the third column times the third component of v, and so on and so forth. And note that the bound here is n, this is the general case. Our n was the number of columns, which was 3, right? So while the sigma notation is a little bit challenging, it is really helpful and we do want you guys to learn how to use it because it gives a succinct way to calculate a given component of this resultant vector w. So the big takeaways here, this section is really rich. There's a lot in here. You should know what it means for something to be a linear transformation, both pieces of that definition and the composite definition here. You should know dimensions of matrices, and you should understand how matrix multiplication is used to determine what happens when a linear function acts on a vector. And you should understand sigma notation and how to use it. We'll move into matrix multiplication in the next video, but this is the beginning of what you need to understand to get through script three in week one.